I'm back with another video. It is part three of chapter three of Women Who Run With Wolves. This is the third task of initiating the intuition. So first things first, if you guys are excited about this book club and these chapters and the parts that we're going through, please subscribe to my channel, hit the bell, and be notified when I put out more parts to the videos. Um, if you guys like this video, because I know you're going to like it, and if you've enjoyed the other videos, please give this video a like if you are enjoying the whole book club thing at all. Um, I definitely would like to know that these are good, and that, therefore I'll be able to like keep making them. Check out the description below to get the book and join the Facebook group and talk to us about it. I think that's all I need to say in the intro. So let's go ahead and get started with the book. All right. <laughs> this is the third task of the chapter. It is called Navigating in the Dark. The description says, Consenting to venture into the locus of deep initiation, entering the forest, and beginning to experience the new and dangerous feeling Newman of being in one's intuitive power. Learning to develop sensitivity as regards to direction to the mysterious unconscious and relying solely on one's inner senses. Learning the way back home to the wild mother, heeding the doll's direction. Learning to feed intuition, feeding the doll. Letting the frail, know-nothing maiden die even more. Shifting power to the doll, i.e. intuition. So, this chapter is all about the doll. Basilius's doll and her getting her through this forest and killing off the naive maiden within her even more. Um, there's this little part in the book that says, Vasilisa's, in Vasilisa's case, the doll represents la, vis, la vida cita. I don't speak Spanish. Tell me if I'm wrong. The little instinctual force that is both fierce and enduring. No matter what mess we are in, it lives out a hidden life within us. The doll represents the intuition passed down from Vasilisa's too good mother to her. Um, it also represents within our own spirits, our own initial and instinctual inner reasoning, knowledge, and consciousness within us. It's the thing that when you're little, you don't know why you know things, but you just know things. So the book says, There is no greater blessing a mother can give her daughter than a reliable sense of the veracity of her own intuition. Intuition is handed from the parent to child in the simplest of ways. You have good judgment. What do you think lies hidden behind all of this? Rather than defining intuition as some unreasoned faulty quirk, it is defined as truly the soul voice speaking. Intuition senses the directions to go in for the most benefit. It is self-preserving, has a grasp of underlying motive and intention, and it chooses what will cause the least amount of fragmenting to the psyche. So basically your intuition keeps you safe. I think that this is really interesting. I find that people with um, single mothers, specifically men with single mothers, because I can think of two in my life, um, that maybe find a sense of strong confidence in their adulthood because they're presented with this quite a lot throughout their lives. They're presented with decision-making just because they're the man of the house um, from a very young age and judgments of situations because the women that are their mothers usually tend to ask them from my experience. Um, for most women, though, I think that that trust in our own intuition and our own confidence is not so innately taught in us in childhood most often. I think it's very often taught to boys, but I don't necessarily think it's taught to girls so much. And I think that because that it's taken away from us, it's a game changer. Um, it really takes away our reliance on our own selves and puts the reliance on figures of authority in our lives such as the government or our parents or relationship 
Um, but the potential of not having that, I think, is incredible because women are incredibly led by our own intuition. And if we were able to have confidence in that leading, then I think we could really change a whole lot. Um, so how does one actually develop intuition? How does one develop their power of intuition? First step would be thinking of intuition as any other type of skill set and therefore practicing it to develop it. Practice for intuition is simply listening to it. The book says, what does one feed intuition so that it is consistently nourished and responsive to our requests to scan our environment? One feeds it life. One feeds it life by listening to it. What good is a voice without an ear to, to receive it? What good is a woman in the wilds of metropolis or daily life unless she can hear and depend upon the voice of La Cassaba, the one who knows? I've heard women say it, if not a hundred times, then a thousand times. I knew I should have listened to my intuition. I sensed that I should or should not have done such and such, but I didn't listen. We feed the deep intuitive self by listening to it and acting upon its advice. It is a personage in its own right, a magical dollish sized being which inhabits the psychic land of the interior woman. In this way, it is like the muscles in the body. If a muscle is not used, it eventually withers. Intuition is exactly like that. Without food, without employment, it atrophies. Intuition is more like a muscle than a bone in that it can be stretched and strained and pulled, but it can never be actually broken. I don't actually know if a muscle can't be broken or if a, or if a bone could be pulled or strained, but that's just kind of an analogy that I came up with. Basically, I've been doing yoga lately. I've been learning about my own intuition through doing yoga because it's teaching me to pay attention to the feelings in my body and to recognize the differences between them. To recognize the difference between stretching that is good for me and stretching that is painful and going to keep me sore tomorrow. And by being honest about my own limits, I'm learning to trust myself more. The book says, we, like Vasilisa, strengthen our bond with our intuitive nature by listening inwardly at every turn in the road. Should I go this way or this way? Should I stay or go? Should I resist or be flexible? Should I run away or toward? Is this person event or venture true or false? The breaking of the bond between a woman and her wildest intuition is often misunderstood as the intuition itself being broken, but this is not fact. It is not intuition which is broken, but rather the matrilineal blessing of intuition, the handing down of intuitive reliance between a woman and all females of her lines who have gone before her. It is the long river of women that has been dammed. A woman's grasp of her intuitive wisdom may be weak as a result, but with exercise, it will come back and become fully manifested. Y'all, it actually ended quicker than I thought it was going to be. I was going to split these videos into a part, and a video for every part of the section. Um, but I think I'm just going to do two sections this time because it just, it's only at like 12 minutes that I'm recording. So I don't think it's going to be that long. Um, so the fourth task is facing the wild hag. It says, being able to stand the face of the fearsome wild goddess without wavering, that is, facing the image of the fierce mother, meeting up with the Baba Yaga, familiarizing oneself with the arcane, the odd, the otherness of the wild, residing at the Baba Yaga's house for a while, bringing some of her values into our lives, thereby becoming ourselves a little odd in a goodly way, eating her food, learning to face great powers in others, and subsequently one's own power, letting the frail and too sweet child die back even further. This is dealing with the imagery of Baba Yaga's house. So the house actually squatted on chicken legs and it actually danced. This is symbolic of the imagery of the psychic training ground of her intuition and it implies that she's suffering from a lack 
of being able to be crazy and dance about and do whatever she wanted to. It says in the book, Now we can see that the Yaga's house is of the instinctual world and that Vasilisa needs more of this element in her personality. This chicken-legged house walks about, twirls even, in some hippity-hop dance. This house is alive, bursting with enthusiasm and joyous life. These attributes are the main fundaments to the archetype psyche of wild women, a joyous and wild life force, where houses dance, where inanimates such as mortars fly like birds, where the old woman can make magic, where nothing is what it seems, and for the most part is far better than it seemed to begin with. I was a little confused about this part at first as well until I realized this and that Basically, the reason why the intuitive world in her psyche has to be so crazy is because living in a hyper-normalcy, hyper-complacency to the mundane world around us causes us just to be too strong on that pattern of life. And in order to dive into our own intuition, we must also dive into a different way of living which is the exact opposite of extreme of just being able to express and be crazy and go and do what we choose to do based on our intuition. Just as the too good mother was imperative of teaching the daughter the steps that are instinctual to her, the Baba Yaga is imperative to teaching her the instrumental steps of her intuition going forward and what to do with the things that she finds along the way. The book says, Baba Yaga is fearsome, for she represents the power of annihilation and the power of the life force at the same time. To gaze into her face is to see the vagina dentata, eyes of blood, the perfect newborn child and the wings of an angel all at once. This is basically saying, the reason this is important is because in order to accept our own intuition, we must be able to open our eyes to that that may scare us. And so being able to accept the fearsome, wild, hag woman it forces us to accept our own fearsome and formidable self within ourselves and therefore open our eyes to all wisdom and divinity which comes in this crucial lesson of initiation. And it's crucial to creating and being a part of real change. It says, and Vizaliza stands there and accepts this wild mother, divinity, wisdom, warts, and all. One of the most remarkable facets of the Yaga portrayed in this tale is that though she threatens, she is just. She does not hurt Vizaliza as long as Vizaliza affords her respect. Respect in the face of great power is a crucial lesson. A woman must be able to stand in the face of power because ultimately some part of that power will become hers. Vasilisa faces Baba Yaga, not boastfully or filled with braggadocio, neither running away or hiding. She presents herself honestly and just as herself. Women in this recovery phase have a difficult time presenting themselves just as themselves, and therefore the Baba Yaga inside of them, the fearsome and formidable woman inside of them, who is dealing with the outside of them being this overly sweet, almost fattening, just overly indulging woman on the outside, the spirits are fighting with each other. This too nice over-adaption in women often occurs when they are desperately feared of being disenfranchised or found unnecessary. Two of the most poignant dreams I've ever heard concerned a woman who definitely needed to be less tame. The first dream was that she inherited a photo album, a special one, with the pictures of the wild mother. How happy she was, until the next week when she dreamed she opened a similar album and there was a horrid old woman looking out at her. The hag was possessed of mossy teeth and had black beetle juice running down her chin. Her dream is typical of women who are recovering from being too sweet. The first dream demonstrates one side of the wild nature, the benign and bountiful, and all that is well with her world. The first dream demonstrates one side of the wild nature, the benign and bountiful, and all that is well in her world. 
But when the mossy wild woman is presented to her, well, uh, uh, could we put this off for a little while? The answer is no. The unconscious in its brilliant way is offering this dreamer an idea about the new way of living that is not just the two-toothed frontal smile of a too nice woman. To face this wild and creative power in ourselves is to gain access to the myriad faces in the subterranean feminine. These belong to us innately and we may choose to inhabit whichever one serves us best at whichever time. This is talking about the fact that we have to deal with the part of us that we're so afraid of everyone rejecting. The part of us that makes us be so overindulging to everyone because we're afraid of letting this part of us out that doesn't want what everybody else wants. And it may be ugly and it may be scary to untrained eyes, but the level of attraction to how you feel is not the issue if you're yelling and screaming about how you feel and someone tells you you look ugly doing it that's not the issue it must be accepted and it must be dealt with because it's there and it's simple as that a good deal of literature on the subject of women's power states that men are afraid of women's power i always want to exclaim mother of god so many women themselves are afraid of women's power for the old feminine attributes and forces are vast, and they are formidable. It is understandable that the first time they come face to face with the old wild powers, both men and women, take one anxious look and make tracks. All you see of them is flying paw pads and frightened tails. It's so clear. If we, we are that strong deep down, and ignoring it isn't going to make it disappear. If we allow ourselves to be strong enough to let it out and accept our truth and discuss it and deal with it, we can be set free. But if not, it will only continue to chase us. And on that subject of men and whether or not they'll be able to deal, Essie brings up a very interesting point. She says, if men are ever going to learn to stand it, then without a doubt, women have to learn to stand it. If men are ever going to understand women, women are going to have to teach the configurations of the wild feminine to them. Okay, guys, that will be the end of those two sections of the book. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Um, I am very much so enjoying doing these, although the sun is going down, so maybe I'll have to film another day. Who knows, but I'm very much so enjoying these. I hope you guys are too. If you are, please subscribe because the next part is coming out tomorrow. So if you hit the bell, you will be notified of when I put out my next part of these videos. Um, so if you guys are interested in hearing about that, go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell next to the subscribe button. Uh, like this video also if you do like these videos so that I know to continue doing them. And let me know if you have any comments or suggestions of anything that you guys are enjoying or want to change or whatever in the comments below. Feel free to join the Facebook group and get to talking with us. I'm excited to be talking to you guys. Uh, follow me on all my social media. I'm super excited for that as well. I love to share. I love to talk. I love to make friends, especially people who are interested in the same kind of stuff as me. And if you're watching this video, you probably are. So please follow me. Um, and talk to me and comment and DM me or something. Um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I love you so much. Thank you for watching my channel. Bye! Y'all, that actually ended. Oh, shit. I just almost ripped my book. Oh, my God. Um.